Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. Today I'm bringing you part one of a multi-part interview with Tug Wilson. Tug's an RAF pilot who flew the F-4 FGR-2 during the Cold War and went on to fly the Hornet on exchange and then later the Tornado F-3. In this episode and the next, we'll talk exclusively about the Phantom. But before you get on with watching Tug's excellent discussion of that jet and his experiences flying it, I wanted to first dedicate this episode to Chris Laidlaw Bell, better known simply as Laidback. Laidback was slated to appear on this channel last year. Uh, he contacted me with some very generous praise for the channel, and I rather cheekily used that to twist his arm into coming on to the channel to talk about his time flying the F4J in RAF service. He also flew the Hawk and later the Meteor and Sea Vixen as a contract fast jet pilot, and I was hoping to get his views on those aeroplanes too. Sadly, Laidback was ill, and although he did share that with me, I didn't realise the extent of his poor health, and he died last year before we could get him on tape. It, it is a testament to both Tug and the bond that exists between RAF Phantom Flyers and no doubt Phantom Flyers the world over, that Tug has no issues with me dedicating this episode in this way. So, Laidback, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get you on the record, but I look forward to meeting you in the big bar in the sky and being regaled by your 10% true stories. To the audience at home, I'll let you get on with the business of becoming acquainted with Tug, but don't forget to like, share, and comment. Enjoy. Tug, welcome to 10% True. Thanks for joining us on the channel. Yeah, no problem. It's nice to uh, nice to see you, Steve. So, Tug, you're a, a bit of an exception to the rule for me because I, I usually don't bring people on who have written books because that implies a certain amount of self promotion. But in this instance, I read your book, uh, Phantom uh, Confessions of a Phantom Pilot, uh, which I'll provide a link to in the description so people can go out and buy it, and they should do. Um, and it was me who contacted you to say, I really enjoyed the book. Would you come on and and talk about flying the Phantom? So, thank you for joining us. I, I think I said to you before we hit record, for me, uh, your book is fantastic for a couple of reasons, but the main one is that it strikes a perfect balance between talking about the technical aspects of the Phantom, talking about some of the anecdotes and the shenanigans you got up to as a Phantom pilot, and then sort of referencing RAF culture at the time. So those are the things that I'd like to talk to you about today. But before we do that, can you tell me why you call Tug and give us a quick introduction as to what your RAF career was like? Yeah, I tell you what, I, w I wish this story was more um, uh, more exciting than it uh, than it is. I think back at the end of the eighteen hundreds, uh, there used to be a an old Admiral Wilson in the uh, in the Royal Navy, and um, he was a bit of a hard ass, and he'd always uh, um, signal the captains of these boats, "If you don't get your boat alongside, I'll send the tugs out for you." And being towed into harbour or towed alongside. I think would be the ultimate embarrassment for a uh, for a captain. It was almost like the first thing that he used to signal these uh, captains. So he was known as Tug Wilson, and uh, um, every um, military person with the surname Wilson is known as Tug throughout all of the uh, services. My father was uh, an armor in the Air Force. He was known as Tug, and it just it just kind of uh, uh, went on from there. So um, yeah, I just wish that was a bit more of a high impact uh, uh, story, but it isn't. Uh, my route to the Phantom <clears throat> was fairly uh, fairly standard. I think I I didn't um, I didn't fly before joining the Air Force at all. My plan was to go to university and do University Air Squadron. Uh, bombed my A levels, so uh, didn't manage to get the university thing. Joined as a direct entrance, and then um, I went to um, elementary flying training on the uh, Chipmunk at uh, Swindeby. Um, and that was a relatively new thing. I was the 10th course of EFT. Prior to that, I think it was 10 hours flying selection squadron, make or break. Um, I figure if I'd have done 10 hours, I'd have been chopped because I didn't show any aptitude early doors. But managed to get about um, 65 hours on the chipmunk and then the standard route into uh, Jet Provost Mark III. Everybody in those days was recruited as a potential fast jet pilot, and you had to make the grade to be fast jet pilot to progress. Um, at the end of that JP3 course, if you were good enough, you went Group 1, Phase 1, and that was onto the Jet Provost Mark V. That was the fast jet route. Uh, you could go Group 2, which was multi-engine, and they farmed uh, the odd um, couple of people off to uh, to Rotary from there. But you had to pass that, that JP3 
uh, course to get somewhere, and then uh, off the valley uh, to get my uh, to get my wings um, on that uh, on that course, and then having got my wings, it was all a case of you know we're not just flying aeroplanes, we're supposed to be fighting them. So I went to the tactical weapons unit at Chivano, the beautiful place in uh, in Devon, and um, took part on a uh, tap weapons course there, which was uh, just brutal, absolutely brutal. It was a bloodbath, really. It was almost like a survival exercise. Uh, came out of that uh, relatively scarred, but um, but got my dream posting to the uh, to the Phantom, and uh, off to the OCU from uh, from there. So fairly standard um, route through, I think, um, and middle to late 80s it, it, it was some some schools were great some not so great and but that was the uh, that was the life so at what point did you start showing an aptitude towards flying then and and so it's curious to hear you say that you, you that wasn't originally your intention and because a lot of people who i i think end up in your profession and you will tell me if i'm mistaken have that dream from a young age they they look up in the sky they go to an air display they talk to, they see the red arrows whatever something inspires them um, and so they they gear up i suppose for that that aspiration all the way through their sort of their their youth and their teen years what what uh, at what point did you realize actually yeah this is cool this is what i want to do and and what what point did you start showing an aptitude for it so I I, uh, I grew up in a, a small town in North Yorkshire called Thirsk, and uh, our um, local town vet was uh, the famous writer James Herriot. Um, so he was very famous at the time. So at about six or seven years old, I think every person growing up in Thirsk harbored this desire to be a vet. And then you kind of quickly found out you had to get like, you know, arm deep in a cow's backside and, and that pretty much turned everybody off from uh, uh, from there. But around that time, my father, he'd left the Air Force by then, but he, he couldn't get it out of his system. And he took us to air shows every year. And a big one where, where we were uh, close to was Church Fenton. It was a massive air show for a relatively small base. We go to Church Fenton every year, and then he took me to Finningley a couple of years. It just started getting under my skin, seeing these aeroplanes. Where I'd... We'd, we'd wait and wait to watch the Vulcan because it was the loudest, uh, heaviest thing. And then in between times, a lightning would flash past. And, and I, ju- I just thought to myself, that'd be so cool if I could, uh, if I could do that. Eventually got my dream, uh, got into the Air Force and found out very quickly that I wasn't particularly good at flying. I didn't really have any natural aptitude. I mean, I've got hand-eye coordination, otherwise I wouldn't have passed the um, selection process. But natural uh, aptitude didn't really come to me. And so I I got over that by just working working my absolute nuts off on every every course that I went on. As soon as I got my wing, I think leading up to get my wings, I obviously showed plenty of aptitude for the Air Force to keep me going. But I always had this kind of imposter syndrome thing that I wasn't good enough. And I certainly wasn't getting as good a marks as the people on my courses, or so I thought. Um, and then I got my wings and it was almost like, wow, you know, I, I, I can do this thing. So maybe there's something in this and, you know, I need to buck my ideas up and back myself a little bit. And, um, but it wasn't until I think I got to the Phantom front line, my first squadron, that, um, that environment was quite tough, but, but it, it, it taught me to stick up for myself and, and back myself, you know, and I, 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 I then started, um, just believing that actually I, I, I wasn't too bad at this uh, uh, at, the, at this game, but it took a fair amount of time to uh, to do that. I think if there's ever a pilot who doesn't have a bit of imposter syndrome, they're the ones you need to watch out for because they don't have that kind of common sense wire in their brain that that tells them they need to keep working hard at this because it is it is a uh, a thing that can just catch you if you don't uh, if you don't put the effort in. That's a really interesting comment because i think especially in the early stages of your book maybe the first third or or half or so that constant fear of being chopped or failing or screwing up and in your case um and i'd like maybe you to expound on it a little bit having characters that you were flying with instructors who were niggling at you um not really supporting you not really there to perhaps get the best out of you but maybe to you know i don't know maybe not set you up to fail but certainly not to really sort of spur you on and that seems to be prevalent throughout the, the first parts of your book what what is the 
the stress like then psychologically living with that all the time. There was a thing out recently about the RAF having this screwed up recruitment and yeah. pilot training process where, where guys and girls are now taking seven years, up to seven years to yeah. get to a frontline squad. And I mean, that must be horrendous. But for you back then when things were working, I'm assuming properly, how difficult was it to exist from day to day with the axe hanging over your head? Uh, it was it, it was almost like a life of, of two halves. We were like two different uh, different people in my in my experience. So the, the constant fear that this thing can be taken away from you at any point makes you work very very hard to uh, to try and ensure that doesn't happen. But because you because you live this life uh, on the squadron where you know every trip is assessed. Um, the further along you got in training. So when we got to TAC weapons, every trip we did with an instructor was pretty much a test ride because that trip, that dual trip, opened you up for three solo trips afterwards. If you didn't pass the dual, you weren't going to be going solo. So it was almost like every trip was a test ride, as opposed to earlier on in training where you have a build-up to a test ride and there's a number of uh, number of trips. You can fail them, but um, but generally it's it's a much more nurturing environment. Um, so all that means is that when you are not flying, um, it, it, it's a, you live life to the full. You know, we um, we did some uh, some brilliant things uh, uh, together as groups of people, a real band of brothers. And it was only brothers in in my time. There were no female pilots when I was uh, when I was a student. And so um, and so it galvanised us together. And you make your I, I truly believe you make your strongest friends in those environments where you're, you're all going through the mill a little bit. I, um, I, lay, uh, I lay into um, how difficult training was in the first third of the book because those two courses, the OCU and TAC weapons before that, they were the hardest courses that we did. And particularly on the TAC weapons, some of the not best instruction. Leading up to that point, all through EFT, uh, Jet Provost and Hawk, I'd had some brilliant instructors. Um, and, but each each school had one um, that you you thought were were reveling in the fact that you were struggling and 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 such. But that's just human nature that that you you fall out with some people or don't have quite the relationship. But I flew with some brilliant instructors. My very first QFI uh, was a man called Dickie Duke. He just died a couple of uh, years ago. He was in his nineties. Kept in touch all the way through uh, all the way through our lives together. Um, he was brilliant, absolutely uh, brilliant. It was like flying with your grandfather, and and you got the impression that when you got success, he was reveling it in, in it as much as as much as you were. And so, but the further along we went, the tougher it became, and the more focused on the front line it was going to be. But I think I think in those latter stages where, um, like I said, I, t- I talk about tactical weapons training. God, we were in the bar every night, just um, just having a beer to loosen our lips to tell everybody how crap our lives were, um, because we'd had such a hard time on the squadron, um, and and the the weekends were just a massive relief and a release for us as well. Happy hour uh, was it was an epic uh, epic time. Uh, you know, people didn't die of alcohol poisoning. I have no idea uh, whatsoever. It's probably you know, uh, pickled my liver for the rest of uh, for the rest of my life. But that's how we dealt with the stress now. So I would finish a course on a Friday, probably start the next one on the Monday. So we didn't really get leave. But you know what? We we had our teeth into it. We we were riding this thing for all it was uh, all it was worth. What the hell else are you going to do with your life but fly these aeroplanes and try to get to the front line? The students now, I um I actually teach a lot of them. I teach human factors now. You know the mental aspects of flying to everybody that comes into the Air Force uh, in whatever role as air crew. And I, I can't I can't understand how they've still got motivation because, like you say, there's some horror stories of taking seven years to get to the fast jet uh, front line. So they've got different frustrations. They're, they're, they're frustrated with the lack of progress. Whereas we, we, we God, we, we couldn't, if you turned around, you'd meet yourself coming back. You know, that was, uh, <laughs> that was how intense it, it, it seemed to be. But you know what? That was um, we all knew that when we signed up. Um, that was what was expected. Uh, what was expected of you. And by the time we got to those difficult courses, and some 
uh, some more difficult instructors, let's say, rather than the nurturing thing we'd had before. You know, we had um, 300 hours under our belts. Um, we were starting to show a bit of cockiness and a bit of confidence in ourselves because we needed to, because the next thing was the uh, was the front line. And if you if you didn't show yourself at the front line, you you were just steamrolled and and you became an also ran. People got chopped from the front line because they they just didn't fit in with the squadron and couldn't stand up for themselves. So uh, I was relatively shy when I joined the air force, and that whole training scheme turned me into the person that I am today. And I'm and I'm very grateful for it. You know, is is there an element then of reverse psychology around that? Then these these individuals were prickly or unsupportive or not nurturing because they knew that's what you would need in order to survive on the front line or were they just dicks i mean yeah i think that was their uh, i think that was their excuse steve that um I, I heard people say it's hard on the front line do you know what it wasn't it was a dream on the front line you had to work hard but it was an absolute dream because if you fitted in okay as most people did because we're all of the same mindset then you were um then people wanted you to succeed at the front line um and that was a revelation uh, uh, for me coming from uh, uh, from the OCU and, and TAC weapons that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm having to work hard here, but these people are, uh, are helping me. The one or two people who were um, who were arseholes were arseholes because they're arseholes. I, I don't think they were smart enough to play any kind of reverse psychology. I don't think that even existed then, Steve, reverse psychology. Um, I think they were just who they were. Maybe they'd add up bad time in the air force and they were cynical and and uh, had no joy or enthusiasm and, and such like that but you know that they, they, they weren't going to stop me from enjoying it even the bad time you know I, I can look back now the stories we tell over dinner or we're at reunions are always um, about that guy who was a particular dick you know and uh, do you remember that time when he uh, when he did this and and these people always get caught out you know we re- we revel in the in the fact that they uh, they got caught out so you know it was just uh, I, as i keep saying it was just part of the life and um and it, it, it and here i am today you know it didn't uh, it didn't kill me and i'm i'm, I'm still here I, I, last question on this then, because it's a it's a, a, a undeniably a negative topic. But last question on it: Do those people turn up to reunions? Are they aware of the perception that others had of them, or did they leave the air force and then that was it? Lot, contact was lost. I don't know. We we have um, uh, we have a phantom reunion every uh, every year just before Remembrance Day in a in a pub um, just off uh, Trafalgar Square, and um, traditionally like two hundred people uh, uh, go along. And uh, the people that uh, that I didn't particularly like, they they turn up, you know, and and I'm sure there's plenty of people there who didn't uh, who didn't like me, and and they're probably going, you know, what's he doing here, uh, sort of thing. We all have our our uh, uh, little cliques. I have to say, it's been a little bit um, cathartic uh, uh, writing the book because you know I've I've told people what what I thought at the time. I had a little bit of um, semi. Um, celebrity status uh, last year because the book had just come out before the reunion. Lots of people had uh, read it basically to see if they were in it. Uh, I think, and uh, I've not had any negative uh, comments from the guys, but uh, but I've not really spoken to any of the people that I've I've called out in there. But m- my point is that um, it sounds like I've got an axe to grind. I, I absolutely haven't. It was what happened at the time, and uh, and I've uh, I've written it as uh, as that. And there's a good chance that in a number of years' time, there will be some students of mine when I was a flying instructor who probably call me out in their books. And and that's that's that was their perception of me at the time. And I can't argue with that. So um, so uh, that's that. The, the um, when we go to these uh, reunions, generally it's all massively positive, and we all tell those same same stories and they get a bit more embellished every uh every so you're getting the best version of them right now if you talk to me next year it'll be even better you know <laughs> speaking of speaking of good stories when so you when you talk about your ab initio pilot training you do reference some poor guy who's trying to lose his virginity um oh god yeah did, yeah did did, did did he manage that in the end Is he did yeah yeah did. yeah it, i mean it took uh uh it took a number of attempts and we were um it, it, it was almost like we ran a we ran a book on it, you know, when it was uh, uh, when it was going to happen. But that was that was a classic um, uh, example of 
um, this pressurized environment. One of our releases was uh, was we banter each other. Uh, I mean, mercilessly. And if you screwed up in the air or on the ground, said something stupid, the herd mentality was that everybody piled onto you and uh, and you were just destroyed with banter. The funny thing was, if you had the instructors bantering you, you knew you got it made because that's that's them just cracking open the door and saying, hey, have you seen how good it is in here? We, we want you in here because they're bantering you. It, it's when they don't banter you and don't talk to you that, that you've got it, uh, you've You've got it hard. So this particular guy, um, I, I don't know what it was. It was just a drunken uh, conversation in the bar one night. I think I'd been the um, uh, uh, subject of some uh, banter over a medical issue uh, that uh, that I'd had, and um, and then somebody kind of pointed out this this guy was probably a virgin. Well, that was it. You know, the heat was off me then, so everybody piles on to uh, to that. But it, it uh, because he bit on it, it became something bigger than it absolutely was. Probably wasn't a virgin at all, but hey, you know, why, why let the truth get in the way of a good story and a good bit of banter? Uh, but it just took on a life of its own. And and was all we discussed in the crew room, you know, for, for weeks on end was, uh, you know, when he was going to break his duck and uh, and consign this thing to history and, and stuff like that. But I, I mean, that's just the stupid things that you would say and do in order to alleviate a bit of the, a bit of the pressure. Yeah, God, that takes me back, yeah. One of the things that I'm, on a more serious note, that I was really interested in, it was just a tiny snippet where you talk about the Abinitio training, and you say, and I can't remember the, the specifics, but, but you say somebody asked you a question about the aeroplane, and you, you said, God, I, I don't know the answer to that. I learned that two weeks ago did the sat and sat the test and then i've dumped it i, I don't yeah. know and, and yeah. I, that just struck me as being phenomenal that you would you go through this process where you're you're sort of i think the american expression is drinking from the fire hose you know there's just yeah. so much that you've got to take in yeah that actually you need to make space for the next bit of information that's coming in how how did you how did you do that because i'm guessing you didn't have the advanced training aids that like cue cards and things like that um that, that people have now there was no probably no chair flying i don't know did you have printouts of the cockpit that you could you know press the buttons that you know pretend to press the buttons that kind of stuff what what was available to you to help you get through that process so i always say i i think there's no substitute in grand school for being in the same classroom as an instructor who knows the subject and you can um uh, you can ask them questions Get them to explain it. They'll draw it up uh, for you in in real time as uh, you know as they build this thing. Now there are so many training aids um, for the students, but a lot of them are uh, self paced learning uh, type stuff. So I, I've I've been in through a number of flying training systems, and uh, and they they seem to think that computer aided instruction is is the way to go, and it isn't. It's it's talking to people and interacting with them with somebody who knows the subject firehose is pretty much it there's a lot of ground school when you first start flying because you know nothing about flying let alone the aeroplane um and then the, the i suppose the um the approach was just keep flinging mud at the wall and it will stick. Uh, it will stick with um, with people. Don't get me wrong. I um, I don't mean to disparage everybody who's ever been through flying training, but um, there, there were some very very clever people who just absorbed all of the information and were able to recount it at any point. They're just very very good uh, good learners. Uh, for me, I, I was struggling enough just um, just flying the aeroplane that to bring my knowledge to the surface was <clears throat> almost an impossibility. So. I, I adopted the learn, exam, dump, go flying um, mantra that I, I would say the majority of people of my generation uh, uh, took that uh, took that on board. Uh, don't get me wrong. I play up to this. Um, I was a bit of a buffoon and, and such like that. I do have a lot of knowledge of, um, of aviation and how the aeroplane works and, and such like that. But when it comes down to it, um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the stuff that stops me from crashing, uh, when I'm first line to uh, learning to fly an aeroplane, and then what what actually helps me shoot other aircraft down or drop bombs in the right place? Those are the things that I really actually did take uh, did take notice of. Um, meteorology is a is a huge huge subject, and 
it was almost like we as pilots were expected to be uh have degrees in in meteorology um when actually you know some some met is on the toss of a coin uh, uh sort of thing it it seemed to be to uh, to us i'm sure it isn't uh but um but for, as a young man trying to cope with all of that stuff with the fire hose uh with the fire hose on um i i absorbed what i thought i needed and stuff just naturally fell by the uh, by the wayside when we got to um uh, I keep going on about tactical weapons. This is like therapy for me, getting all the TAC weapons uh, stuff out. But our arrival brief at TAC weapons was, um, right, you lot, you've got your wings now, so we're not going to spoon feed you. The fire hose is on, so open up and uh, and start drinking. You know, welcome to Chivana. And and the guy at the boss had storm out uh, sort of thing. So, But to tell you the truth, the fire hose was on all the way through, uh, all the way through training. We had cardboard cockpits, best money um, the Air Force has ever spent in flying training, a proper sized cutout of the cockpit in cardboard, um, just in 2D, you know, no switches on it or anything like that. You'd set it up on your desk, you'd move your chair in, put the consoles on the side of your armchair so that they were roughly in the right place. And we would do what is now called armchair flying. It just wasn't called armchair flying in those days. We learned checks, uh, checklists that way. Uh, we learned uh, instrument scans for when we were doing instrument flying. Uh, but actually, we taught ourselves sortie management, how to do uh, what it would feel like in aerobatics and, and, and things like that. Everything that was coming up the next day, we could practice in our armchair using these cardboard uh, copies. Now students have got Microsoft uh, uh, Flight Sim. Uh, they've got VR headsets. Uh, they can go to... Um, uh, after hours to the uh, squadron buildings and sign out the simulator and, and and the simulators have really high fidelity. So there's lots of training aids out there. Um, we had a cardboard cockpit and it worked. You know, it, it worked for us. The key, I, I always think, is not the device. It's, um, it's what you put into it and how you immerse yourself in it. And you find a training uh, plan for you that works. So... Some people didn't like the cardboard cockpit. They closed their eyes and thought about flying because they could picture it. Um, it it's just whatever works for you. We'd uh, we would we would maximise that. You know. You had to, I think one of your classmates was chopped. One of the NAS was chopped. Um, if I remember correctly, what what's the impact that that has on you and your other classmates? Uh, this on the Phantom OCU. Um, we had two navs chopped and a pilot. Uh, so, uh, which, to tell you the truth, that was fifty percent of our course, the ab initio side of it. Um, to tell you the truth, that that shouldn't really happen at an OCU. You know, people should have been weeded out by by that point. And by weeded out, I mean uh, their shortcomings should have been exposed a lot earlier in the in the training system uh, with that. When somebody gets chopped, uh, to tell you the truth, we, we go all the way through the course. It's when somebody fails a trip, it's actually uh, it's pretty harsh on the on the whole course because all of a sudden we all feel quite vulnerable. Up to that point, we've all been passing trips and it's all been hoo-ha and, and everybody's great and they're, they're trying to help us through. And then the, the second somebody fails a trip, oh, my God, all of a sudden, you know, we're all uh, we're all vulnerable. We're all going to catch failure off the guy that's uh, that's failed the trip. Um, and then it's a mark of a good course as to how they rally around and, and then help that person who's failed. And I failed a number of trips uh, through training and I always had help from my uh, from my buddies uh, to do that and always try to do that when somebody around me failed. But yeah, um, yeah, three, three out of six of us have initios chopped. And um, it, it's when they do get chopped, it's, it can happen very quickly. So somebody can struggle on a trip and fail it. They get a refly. If they fail it again, they go on a review package. So maybe they'll get one or two extra trips and then a refly. And that refly is the chop, uh, is the chop ride. Or if they've shown a really poor trend over a couple of trips, uh, so failed two trips in a row, it might be that they don't even give them the review package. They just put them up for a chop ride because they pretty much know they're not going to make it. And that happened to the uh, pilot who was chopped on my uh, on my course. 
And it happens in the, in the space of two or three days. And the next thing you see is they're not in a flying suit. They're in their blues having a, uh, a chop interview uh, with the boss of the squadron. And it's, it's brutal um, because by the time you got to an OCU, people are, people are flying the dream airplane that they wanted to fly mostly and, uh, and to have that taken away. And so we tend to go for, um, uh, you know, everything in my day was um, sorted out or salved through the, uh, through the judicious uh, application of alcohol. You go to the bar and you almost had like a wake um, for, the, uh, uh, for the people who had, uh, who had been chopped. And then, do you know what? You go to the squadron the next day and the biggest thing in your mind is your next trip. And they're, they're gone and forgotten. And it's a horrible thing to say, but that was the nature of the, uh, of the beast. If you don't now turn on and concentrate on your next trip, it might be you in the blues in three days' time. And, that, and you would do anything to, uh, uh, to avoid that. So that's, that's generally how, how it goes. And when I was instructing after my first tour, I saw the same thing, you know, and I think generation to generation is it's exactly the same. Did you ever did you ever meet any of those guys again uh, later in your career? Were they happy? Were they settled? Was there... Yeah, so um uh the guy who um who got chopped, uh, you know, swings and roundabouts, yeah, loses his virginity and uh, within a couple of weeks he's chopped from the uh, from the phantom. Um he went uh, he went Nimrod, so I think I bumped into him once. Um, at the bar at uh, Wildenrath on my first tour, um, the pilot. Wow, I mean, he went um, he went to fly Hawks on the hundred squadron. You know, the, our sort of semi-aggressor squadron they were then, uh, towing a lot of flags and 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 providing targets. Went back through the the whole system. Went uh, went Jaguars. I think he got chopped off the Jaguar. Went back through the system and went Tornado G01. It was like he was trying every fast jet in the uh, in the inventory. And I think he eventually I think he eventually uh, did did well on the uh, on the Tornado G01. And then ended up as a attack weapons instructor. And, and that was that. And he would talk about somebody not not giving up. You know, mm. not giving up on the dream. And and good for him. You know, he. he he ended up doing that. I think I came across him once, uh, and that was uh, that was when he was uh, he was on the Hawk on a hundred squadron and saying that he was going back through the system again. Presumably, then for him, there was something that they they felt was addressable. It wasn't there wasn't intrinsically anything um, about him that meant he couldn't do the job ultimately. Because um, because that's what they do. They look at money, don't they? I suppose there's an argument yeah. that you can get anybody through the training system if you spend enough money on them. Yeah, I suppose. That. Yeah. I mean, he uh, he failed on uh, on the Phantom on Air Combat, which was um, uh, it was a pretty uh, difficult phase for um, for the pilots. The F four OCU was set up that uh, initially the first phase was convex conversion to the aeroplane. That was really difficult for the pilots. Uh, the navs just did a couple of uh, couple of trips in the in the boot with instructors. Then it got to the uh, basic radar phase, which was bad for the navs, easier for the pilots. I, I say easier, easier than uh, we still had to fly the airplane, fly formation, not crash, all that uh, sort of stuff. Um, and then um, it was the air combat phase, which was all pilot um, type stuff. So th there were various phases where um, it was e easier in inverted commas for the pilots than it was for the navs and vice versa. Now he got chopped on probably the hardest pilot uh, phase and it was it was over halfway through the course. So maybe they just thought, put him on the back on the hawk for a couple of years just to get some confidence up again, and then see where we're at. I think uh, I don't know. I, I'm talking out of turn, and um, uh, he could come on and tell you his life story. I'm sure. I think to go back through the system and then send him Jaguars. I think he, that was asking a lot of uh, of somebody, uh, anybody, even uh, not not just him. Uh, and so th I think that's why he, he probably found a spiritual home on. Tornado GR1, you know, Twin Seat again. And um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge, huge fan of Twin Seat uh, flying. You mentioned in the book, um, you sort of uh, almost sort of disparagingly say that there was no chance of you going single seat. So, so people didn't have to worry too much about that. But yeah. can you explain why that is? And although it might sound like there's an obvious answer to it, I'm keen to hear what you think of it anyway. But what, what is the distinction between a single-seat fast jet pilot and a two-seat fast jet pilot? Yeah, I'll, um, I've got to um, 
uh, I bury a little uh, a little ghost here. I, I I tend not to talk myself up uh, at all. I'm I'm very self deprecating, and uh, I've had a great career. Uh, some of it has been a, a little bit blind luck, you know, and and such like that. Um, at the end of Tack Weapons, um, the boss called me in, and you had to give your um, what what do you want to fly? Three three choices. Now I'd always wanted to fly the uh, the lightning. And when I joined TAC Weapons, they were still taking Lightning students. It was right at the end of the Lightning. And about a month into it, they said, right, no more Lightning students. So I thought, well, what's the next best thing? If I want to be a fighter pilot, it's the Phantom or the Tornado F3, F2. Uh, maybe it was just coming to be the F3 then. That had a, a dog's reputation, you know, uh, the whole concrete radar uh, type stuff and, and whatnot. And it, and it did seem that, most of the instructors that seem to be having a good time at TAC Weapons were Phantom guys. And they seem like decent guys. So um, so that was my that was my thing there. Anyway, the boss called me in and he said, you've put Phantom first. I said, uh, yeah, I'd put Phantom, Tornado F3, and then Tornado GR1, I think, as my choices. And he said, why didn't you put uh, Harrier or Jaguar? And I just started laughing. I said, boss, you know how bad I am at ground attack, for goodness sake, you know. And, uh, and I said, then, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not getting a single seat recommend. And he said, well, I'm here to tell you that you are. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I actually did get a single seat recommend. But it wasn't the lightning. There was no lightning. I certainly, no kidding, uh, even if even if he was, he was bullshitting me uh, and I wasn't good enough, there was no way I was going to go ground attack. And certainly not. I certainly wasn't up for being able to fly a Harrier or even a Jaguar. And I hated bloody ground attack. You know, I loved air combat and uh, an intercept. So it was going to be the phantom for me. I think what we're looking for is somebody that is um, is able to operate outside of the pure environs of of operating a fast jet. Now, operating a fast jet is not just you in the cockpit flying the aeroplane. It's thinking outside. It's thinking ahead. Um, those with the single seat uh, um, ability are able to do that a bit more than those who are not quite there yet. I didn't think I was quite there yet. I think the boss was uh, was just spinning me a line. Uh, but if um, if the lightning had still been there, then that would have been my first choice. And with the single seat recommend, I might have um, been able to be one of the last lightning pilots as opposed to one of the last phantom pilots. Well, there's a question. Which would you rather have had? Oh, of course now... Um, look, if, if I'd only ever flown the Tornado F3, I'd be on here telling you that was the best aeroplane in the history of aviation, but it isn't. The Phantom is. Uh, and uh, and the Phantom was much more capable than the Lightning. Had I gone Lightnings, so I'd have been Lightning, True Blue, cut me open and it says, uh, it says Lightning. And you know what? And there's something wrong with a pilot who doesn't have this romantic view of his first aeroplane at, uh, at the front line. So for me, I adult, I, I'm Forgive me. Uh, I'm not even. I'm barely looking at you, Steve, on this uh, interview. I'm looking at that beautiful blue phantom uh, behind you because I was the first pilot to fly blue Zulu in that blue uh, livery, and I adore that uh, that aeroplane. And uh, and that is just the end of it. Yeah, if I'd flown lightnings, that would have been uh, that would have been awesome, and would have been the best uh, uh, aeroplane ever. But it's not, you know. So so we will get to talking about the. The Phantom in a minute, um, but but before we do that, I wanted to ask you another question then around instructional technique. So you've referenced a couple of times the brutal nature of TAC weapons, and then the you know sort of varied nature of the OCU. Um, you do relate brilliantly uh, the instructional technique of a French instructor you had on Jet Provost. Could you tell us oh, a yeah. little bit about him and what what he would do, what what the instructional technique was, and the effect yeah, that it yeah. had on you? Yeah, Captain Julian. I, I will, uh, God, I'll remember this guy till the day I, I die. He was quite a short guy. He was a Mirage um, fighter pilot. And uh, he walked around and just oozed cool because he was French and outrageous, you know. And he was the only one who had a leather flying jacket because the French um, um, had leather flying jackets given to them by the French Air Force, whereas we had our uh crappy kind of camouflage green uh, uh, thing. So, uh, so he looked incredibly cool. Um, he had the most outrageous French accent, though, and I, I you could barely understand the word that he said. 
and he flew with um he was primary instructor for a guy a guy called john on on our course who ended up going uh, buccaneers uh in the end and um they had this kind of relationship that that really worked and um and it was almost like John was able to take the mick out of this Frenchman and, and vice versa. Now that's fine because he flies with him a lot. I then, I fly with him on a circuit trip. Um, we had to go from uh, Linton on News to Topcliffe to deploy for the day and, and do circuits. Now that sounds like a very, very easy trip. It's not when you're a student, you know, Topcliffe's literally a few miles up the road and there's a lot to do. You have to depart Linton, join Topcliffe in the, in the official manner, all the proper comm. And, uh, and I had this Frenchman next to me. It was the first time I'd flown with him. I couldn't understand a damn word that he said. And, and I wasn't very good at that point. And it just made it worse and worse and worse. Well, I, I just thought, God, I hope I never fly with this guy again. And then I ended up flying with him on a close formation uh, trip. And when you flew close formation with three aeroplanes, we were number three. You used the call sign of your instructor whenever you flew with an instructor. So if you weren't doing particularly well, you were embarrassing his call sign. You know, it wasn't your personal call sign. It was his, you know. So um, anyway, he um, in the most outrageous accents, he, he, every time, cl flying close formation when you first do it, it's quite a quite a scary thing to do, quite difficult. You squeeze the stick so hard, the buttons are popping out the top, you know, and you, your legs are tensed up on the, um, on the rudder pedals. And you saw the throttle back and forwards and it, there's no finesse in it whatsoever when you first start doing it. And so his way of calming me down was to just shout at me, relax, uh, we'll saw like that, we'll saw, relax. And um, and he just went on and on shouting, relax. You know, and you, you want to sit there and you're <laughs> gripping the stick and you just want to look at him and go, that isn't helping, you know, And uh, but you can't because he's just so maxed out with it. And he would grip your thigh to see if your if your legs were relaxed. Well, that freaked me out completely because it came out of nowhere, you know. And, and I'm trying to form it on the wing, and I'm bouncing around uh, uh, on the bungee. And then um, we come in for the uh, the um, recovery back to the airfield. And the way we would do that is we'd um, at the last in the last few um, few seconds to once the leaders lined up on the runway he'd call us into echelon. Uh, and so rather than having one uh, aeroplane on each wing, you would then swap and we'd all be in a, in a line, one, two, and three. And that's how we would break into the circuit. Now, it's always a bit, um, you, number three is always under a bit of pressure to get into formation by the time you arrive over the airfield because you know that everybody on the ground is watching every formation that comes in. And there are there was 120 students at Linton when I went through plus probably the best part of 100 instructor, the instructors and every single one of them is a critic. And if you're not in formation, you're going to get absolutely dogged by everybody. But of course, it's not my call sign, it's his. So he doesn't want to be uh, um, embarrassed uh, by this thing. And he keeps shouting at me to get in there. And he's going, get in there, Wilson, get in there. Like that, and we've literally just been talked into, um, uh, called into echelon. So it, I'm not going to be able to get in within two seconds. But he's just on me uh, like that. Anyway, I'm not getting in there, and it's just too, it's just too much for him. And he says, "Get in there, Wilson! You embarrass me! You embarrass my call sign! Get in there!" And then he says, "If you don't get in there, I will bite you like a dog, like a dog!" I say at the top of his voice in the cockpit. We well, can imagine. That is, that's as instructional technique goes, that, that's just not going to work for me. And I bounced around up and down on the wing like some kind of kangaroo. It looked horrific. And thank God, you know, we broke into the circuit and, and landed. I was absolutely exhausted. I mean, hyperventilating, just dealing with him, let alone, uh, let alone the, uh, uh, the aeroplane. He was ultra cool, though, an ultra cool fighter pilot you know but um just not just not my kind of instructor did you have to fly with him again uh no i never flew with him uh, after that uh, that trip i think it was probably so traumatic for both of us that he <laughs> uh he probably went to see the boss and said uh you know i cannot fly with this real song you know uh uh and wanna be yeah, i never uh, never managed to fly with him again he, he was all right you know don't, don't get me wrong he was fun in the crew room and 
uh, and on the squadron and such. But dear God, thank God I never flew with him again. So, so tell us about the Phantom then. You, you, one of the things that I, I said at the beginning that your book is noteworthy for a couple of reasons, and I said the first was that you know it's a good balance between those three different things of technical, anecdotal, and, and cultural reference. But the other is that it it, it reads like a sort of. Uh, a love affair with the Phantom, and you just talked about yeah. that being the byproduct of it being your first your first fighter. But what did you? What does it feel like walking out to the pan and seeing a Phantom and knowing you're you're going to go and fly that? What's what's the relationship that you the emotional relationship you have with the aeroplane? Yeah, I'm not spinning in line. I've just got um, I just got goosebumps uh, uh, when you said that because it takes me back to that uh, to that time. The, um, it's big uh, for starters. Bearing in mind, I've only flown a hawk at this point, and the hawk is almost like you you pull it up around your around your middle like a pair of trousers. It's it's so small, and then um, you get to this thing, and it's a proven war machine. Um, you know, lots of legendary people have flown this aeroplane uh, prior to you walking up to it, and it was almost like uh, Steve. It was almost like I felt as I walked up behind it. It kind of looked over its shoulder at me, of uh, oh, is this is this the next one then? You know, well, let's see, let's see what you've got, uh, uh, sort of thing. And um, it, you know, it, it leaked, it was dirty. It it is an ugly looking aeroplane when you look at some of the beautiful aeroplanes that uh, that are out there. I, I climbed up the steps, and I, I, my God, I, I mean, are these steps ever going to end? Uh, I felt like it was on oxygen getting in the uh, getting in the cockpit. And you start up the APU. The the APU itself is is a, a an ear splitting noise, and we're out on a pan as well. And not even in a has where it's even it's even worse. And I was I was shocked by the by the noise of it. You get the engine started, and the whole thing rumbles a little bit. It's not like when you you know you start up a prop engine and the, and the whole aeroplane uh, um, vibrates a bit. And and you fly helicopters. You know that must be a, that must be a like being in a washing machine with a heavy metal band, isn't it? Uh, flying a, hel- a helicopter, but the whole thing will shake. Well, this thing it rumbled and grumbled up up inside you uh, because th- there was just this untapped power uh, uh, behind you that that was relatively scary. And then you know you taxi this thing out, and to all intents and purposes, you're in the cockpit, and it, it could be any other any other aeroplane um, until you get to the runway. And then um, all of a sudden, you you feel that um, uh, that power that you, at some point you're going to have to tame and be in control of. But that those first few takeoffs, I, I was I was pretty much hanging on. You know, I was a I was a passenger, uh, and this thing decided it was going to take me airborne and 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 play around with me mm-hmm. until you start to get a feel for it, and then. Uh, I feel then after a few trips, it, uh, I'm almost in control of, of some of this stuff and your confidence builds a little bit. And and then it does something that catches you out and it just makes you reset uh, uh, back to it. And then the more you fly it, the more confident you uh, uh, you get with it. Uh, but that was it. I, um, I, uh, I don't care. I, I did think it was trying to kill me on the first uh, on the first takeoff, but it was like. Um, you know when you ride a roller coaster and and you feel a little bit sick um, going onto it, and then you ride it and that first drop or that first acceleration is not particularly pleasant, and then you get off the ride afterwards and they say, "What what do you think? I loved it. I'm going back on it," and that was it. And that was where and I've 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 I. I wanted to find a different angle for. There's plenty of people written about the Phantom. There's much more capable people have flown this uh, this thing. Uh, they know a lot more about it from a technical point of view. Um, my angle was that I wanted to show people that um, I did love this. You know, I did love this era. I fell in love with it. And uh, that if you can be in love with a something that's not a sentient being, you know, if you can be absolutely smitten by a big, ugly piece of stinking metal that smells when you start it up and, and makes you feel you come out of it you're sweaty and horrible it's a horrible lifestyle you know really uh, we constantly stink and, and we're sweating buckets if you can fall in love with something like that that's what i'm trying to uh, that's what i'm trying to convey and i hope it comes across you know on uh, uh, on this while we're 
uh, while we're talking here. I I I I wrote a love letter to it. That's uh, that's pretty much what it is. But not just a love letter to the Phantom, a love letter to the Navs that I flew with as well and enjoyed that because um, too many. I think too many of us pilots get get wrapped up in. Uh, you know, we're pulling the aeroplane around with a big I am and, and stuff like that. But this was this. The, there were. Oh, let me quote a bit of Princess Diana. There were three of us in this relationship. Yeah, there was me, my navigator and my aeroplane. And um, and we we loved each other. That was uh, that was it. Even when I flew with the nav that uh, I didn't particularly like, um, then there was just something special when the canopies came down. There was a three-way kind of um, uh, love affair going on, and uh, and we tried our best to be as good as we could for uh, for each other. That aeroplane gave me um, life experiences I I, I couldn't buy. Uh, it uh, it gave me psychological help. It turned me into the person that I am today. Uh, it gave me confidence, um, and I tried to give it the the best that I could. You know. Um, I tried not to get shot down in it because uh, I figured that'll be pretty embarrassing for the aeroplane if it gets shot down by another aeroplane. You know, I kind of, I almost in my mind gave it some life, you know, and and I think that's why I gelled, uh, I gelled with it uh, so much. And that was what I had to do in order to get the very best out of me as well. It was more than just flying an aeroplane uh, for me. It was, um, it was my life. It, it really was. Is there a point then, so in the book you mention, and it's really towards the end, so you talk about a couple of mishaps, you know, sort of landing, tyres bursting, not for you, but for somebody else, and there being a fault trace yeah. to the tyres. You talk about you having some engine issues a couple of times, a compressor stall, engine trying to cook itself. You talk about that a couple of times. But but is there a point then as you're flying the aeroplane over a period, a period of years and you're you're on the front line, where actually you are jolted back to reality and you realize that it is a machine and that it, yeah. um, you know, the love affair is great, but actually this is nuts and bolts put together, metal engines, spinny bits, you know, and, 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 and are you sort of brought back down to earth in those moments and the romance goes? Yeah, it does. Uh, it's like, um, it's like an out of um, life experience, I suppose, you know, I'm loving flying my aeroplane. And then all of a sudden something goes wrong. I mean, uh, what did I have? Like a hundred hours under my belt and the nose wheel collapsed on landing. You know, we crashed on landing on my first tour uh, because of metal fatigue in the, uh, in the nose gear strut. Um, a pretty horrible um, uh, engine failure in the, uh, in the Falklands. And it does, it, it kind of drags you back to reality. We have this, um, we have this thing that I think they call it shock factor or something uh, now. Uh, we call it jelly man. Uh, time where something horrific goes wrong in the aeroplane and all your limbs turn to jelly and your, your tongue and you can't communicate properly and that happens that happens for about one to two seconds i think in my uh, in my uh experience of doing this stuff yeah i was um i was integrated with this thing i i, I treated it as something that was uh, was alive um, my jelly man time when something did go wrong that was the jolt back to the fact that um, uh, actually if I don't do the professional pilot stuff here of handling this emergency this thing that I love and adore is going to crash me into the ground and kill me you know at uh, at worst so yeah you, you it, there's there's a certain I I'm, de I'm definitely looking back uh, uh, Steve with uh, rose tinted spectacles in a much uh, much more romantic way about the uh, about the aeroplane but there were lots of periods at the time it was still difficult to fly and stuff went wrong and therefore um learn exam dump is is going to catch you out and it, and it did catch me out um, on one particular occasion uh, when i had a um a big big um engine surge you know but that was um uh, that was that if i'd have been a much more professional pilot um i wouldn't have got myself into trouble by not doing the right drill uh, uh, kind of thing. But then I figure if I'd have been a much more professional pilot, I wouldn't have had half as much fun as I absolutely I absolutely did, you know. Can, can you tell us about that? One of the things that I did say to you before we recorded, hit record was that I don't want to ask you just to repeat the book. Um, that's not the purpose of this, and I want to make sure that people do go and buy it, so go and buy it. Um, but can you tell us about that engine 
failure or that engine surge and what happened and just tell the story yeah yeah i mean look i'll tell you every story that uh, that's in the way i'm not on here uh, as you said to uh, uh, to plug a book this is about my time on the phantom and i've written about everything in there so the stories are going to be the stories so we were uh, we were airborne at night um i probably had about 250 hours on the airplane at this point um i had the um one of the uh, junior navigators flying with me. He joined the squadron a month before me. Um, so he had about 250, 300 hours. But our flight commander, had, um, who was leading the mission, had uh, 1,000 or 1,500 hours. He had a 1,000 hour nav in the back. So we were quite badly uh, mismatched uh, for that. And we were doing uh, supersonic intercepts at night. Now, because we could go in supersonic and we're, in, we're based in Germany, we have to stay above 36,000 feet. Uh, otherwise, we blow everybody's uh, windows in in uh, over Dusseldorf and Munchen Gladbach. So um, we separate out by seventy miles because that was the standard split to do a supersonic intercept, and we go through our supersonic um, acceleration profile, which is called the Rutowski climb. It's quite a famous uh, uh, thing. So you unload the airplane to zero g, push the stick until you get zero g on. That means there's no drag on the airplane; it's going to accelerate like you read about. Uh, put it up to uh, dry power, go full afterburner. So the, the way we did it, the Phantom was there was a, there was a dry power stop, and then we rocked the throttles outboard towards the outside of the aeroplane uh, to the left, and that lit the burner, and then you had the full range of travel from the burner. Um, you do that while unloading the aeroplane and diving down. You get to about 1.2 Mach quite quickly, um, and then you ease the nose up, still in full burner, and you'll get about 1.3, 1.4 in the climb, hopefully topping out at about 1.5 as you level out. At, we're probably up at 45,000 feet at this point. Um, and you do the intercepts uh, up there. And there are various techniques for doing high-level intercepts, um, supersonic and stuff. Handling is different and, and, and whatnot. So that's the idea. And he's doing the same thing as my target. So I, I as soon as I rock the throttles uh, outboard into burner and go full burner, there is a massive bang on the left-hand side. And um, I always, uh, uh, so learn exam dump. My, um, the only thing I retained from jet engine theory, I think, was flame out the back very good, flame out the front very bad. Uh, and I had this huge, I mean, 15, 20 foot flame of, uh, uh, of fire and fury out of the left hand intake um, coming side in with a huge bang. And it lit up the canopy um, and, the, and the night sky. So um, I, pulled them back out of uh, back out of burn all the way back to idle and that's an engine surge so the the compressors or the uh, there's some damage to either compressor or the turbine or i've just got interrupted airflow and and such like that so the drill is you pull the throttle back to idle and then check the turbine temperature so that's the only temperature we've got uh, in the airplane and the turbine temperature on the left was up at a thousand degrees I and mean, it was pegged off the top stop so that means the surge is locked in Normally, if you bring a throttle back to idle after a surge, it, the engine will clear and cough a bit and, and it should be good to go. Uh, but the turbine temperature is the is the key with that. Because I was at 1,000 degrees, the surge is locked in, the drill is to shut the engine down, which is what I did. And this all happens in a, in a, number, of, a number of seconds. Well, we're now being um, bollocked rigid by the German ground controller because we're below 36,000 feet and, uh, and supersonic. So for the first time in my life, I've called Mayday. Uh, pretty much just to shut him shut him up because the M word is uh, is quite a stark word in aviation. So my uh, flight commander, uh, his mayday, bells me up and says, you know, what have you had? I said, we had a left-hand engine surge. It was locked in. I'll shut the engine down. And I was kind of expecting him to join on us and give us some help. You know, we're, we're almost like we're a junior crew sort of thing. Come and help us through the checklists and and lead us back to Wildenrath, maybe do the comm for us. He didn't do a bit of that. He, he didn't get any closer than 45 miles away, I think, and said, right, I'll see you on the ground then and scoot it off, you know. So we're left on frequency with this very irate German uh, ground controller. And uh, and I thought, holy shit, you know, but, well, I'm sure we can do this, uh, uh, Duncan. Uh, Duncan got into the cards. Cards were written really badly in those days, the flight reference cards. So he had fingers in about five different cards trying to do the drills. And we had to take an approach end cable as well. So there's another drill for that and, and whatnot. Um, so in our defense, um, 
we were taught on the OCU, when you got to the end of a card, an emergency card, it never said drill continues over leaf or anything like that. Turn the card over and you will and, and do the drill on the other side if appropriate. They're the key words, if appropriate. So the, the drill on the other side was uh, relighting the engine. So I had to go at that and it seized at about 20% with a big bang. And that was that. Um, we, we came back, got into the, uh, got into the cable. Uh, you know, I thought we were going to get medals. You know, we'd done such a, uh, such a good job. Uh, it was only afterwards I was writing flight safety signal that the flight commander finally caught up with us. I took him through what we'd done and my God, they went through me like a dose of salts, you know, what were you doing? What the hell were you doing trying to relight an engine that had been at a thousand degrees? You know, it's cooked itself to death. Now, bearing in mind, I'd done jet engine theory three times in my life, jet provost, Hawk and the Phantom. Um, but because I'd done learn exam dump, I, I couldn't bring it to the surface that this was a, you know, and we were, we were buzzed with adrenaline as well. You know, it was quite a big, uh, big deal, a big bang, a big flame. And um, we didn't do the best job that, uh, uh, that we could, particularly me. And, um, and the, uh, I remember, God, I remember it to this day, uh, the ground crew came in uh, to the ops, ops room. Uh, there was hardly anybody on the squadron because it was nightfall. And he said, you might want to come out to the house and have a look at this, sir. So we, we, we tro trolled out to the, uh, to the house with, uh, with the flight commander still bollocking me as we walked out there in the dark. And they had this big hessian sack behind the uh, jet pipe. And they were stiff arming all of the uh, compressor blades, uh, sorry, the turbine blades. Um, into this Hessian sack. So when we had the initial surge, we might have lost a chip out of one of the blades or something like that in either the compressor or the turbine, I suppose. By trying to relight the engine, apparently I'd stripped um, the turbine completely. So I think it was two stages of turbine, maybe three, I can't remember. Uh, so at least, you know, 150 blades, something like that. But they'd blown out through the um, through the afterburner mesh, destroyed the afterburner at, at the back. So, two hundred and fifty pounds worth of engine in nineteen ninety. So you can imagine, and it was destroyed. You can imagine how popular I was, all because uh, you know I under that pressure, because I'd done learn exam dump all that time. I I, I couldn't bring that to the surface uh, because I was uh, I was jelly man. Uh, at the uh, at the time and then you know I was the object of ridicule for three weeks until the next guy screwed up and then you know all all we needed was a virgin to turn up on the squadron <laughs> and I'd have been in the clear you know but uh, uh, but that was how it went then you were uh, you were that you were under the microscope until the next person screwed up mm. um, and you know it's just I, I look back at it, it's a great story uh, but I, I wasn't at my professional best um, at that point to tell us about that then because you uh, it's clear through the the book that there's this um development and you know sort of as as you get more hours you become more comfortable more confident uh, it seems it feels like you enjoy it more um do you then over time make up for those inadequacies in learning by because the things that you used to have to think about you no longer have to think about you just do and therefore you now have capacity to go back and hit a book and read it and, and yeah you know yeah, so um, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoyed every single trip, um, uh, even the ones where I was uh, maxed out. You know, I was I was absolutely loving it. I was living the life of a fighter pilot, even when I was on the OCU and there was a chance I could be chopped. You know, I, I was still I was living fast. You know, I, I've I've not lived as much in my life since I think. Um, but um, all it takes is one incident like that to um, blow your reputation for a uh, for a little bit. But what you what we tend to look at as I think as pilots when we look at our colleagues is we look at their body of work, not that one incident. We look at a body of work. Yeah, people could uh, could rail on me for being an idiot uh, for that one incident, but what did I achieve uh, throughout the rest of it? So if you went to a Germany squadron, your tack check. So you've done work up on the squadron, the tack check that gives you your operational badge that goes here. So this is the real badge that means something. In Germany, it was a four-ship lead. So I led four Phantoms from my own squadron out to a combat air patrol area, and then four F-16s turned up, and I managed eight airplanes on cap. Now, the, um, 
uh, tech check for the UK was different. I think it was a pairs league. And so we, we rated ourselves a, a lot in Germany. Now, the UK squadrons, they were tanking all the time. They were doing eight-hour uh, QRA flights. We didn't get that because that wasn't our life. Our life was five minutes readiness. Nobody else was on five minutes readiness. Um, shoot down the Russian hordes as they come across the border. Uh, a shit or bust, you know. And if we shot a missile, it was the start of World War Three, and that was that. And it was a different, uh, a different lifestyle. But we rated ourselves in Germany, and and I, I've spoken to a lot of uh, Tornado GR One guys, Jaguar guys, even Harrier guys. And uh, if they come across somebody on their own fleet who didn't serve in Germany, it's almost like a yeah. So what did you do then? You know, like that. So our body of work in Germany, I think, was was always a a good bolster to your reputation. So when I did move back to the UK, there was a bit of resentment from people who had not served in Germany, but those who had served in Germany rated you very quickly, almost straight away on 56 squadron. When I went to my uh, second squadron, um, you know, maybe my 10th trip on the squadron was a four ship lead check. Mm. And there have been guys who had gone to um, UK squadrons at the same time I'd gone to Germany they, they weren't doing four ship lead checks. They weren't even doing four ship lead workups. So you are, like I said, judged on the body of work uh, and what you've done. And and it takes um, every day you do a trip and nothing untoward happens. It builds your reputation a bit. Every time you do a trip and you have an engine failure and you deal with it and you bring it back safely onto the ground, your reputation builds. And a lot of things went wrong with the uh, with the Phantom, and people were good at dealing with those uh, those things. So on the whole, um, we we had much more successful trips than we had, you know, that odd one or two trips where I showed my lack of professionalism or lack of knowledge. Uh, that that was maybe at the front line, two or three trips out of two and a bit years. Yeah. So. Yeah, not quite as uh, bleak as I paint it, I suppose. But of course, Steve, all the great stories are the ones where things go wrong and you don't quite do it right, but you get away by the skin of your teeth. You know, those are the, the really cool stories. I want to talk about Germany, but before we do, um, it's noteworthy, and maybe it's by design, because you did say to me before we hit record, um, you know, you're not sort of you know, sort of a big, big on the sort of you know, talking about all the technical details and stuff. But you talked about the Spey engine, and you said it made the Phantom look a bit fatter. And yeah. I do have a, a, a sort of a, another guest who's been on recently, who who was an F four guy, an American, and he, he he said to ask you about why it looks like it's put on weight. But yeah, that wasn't what I was going to ask you. What I wanted to ask you was about performance, and what I wanted to ask you about was whether or not you could discuss if you have enough background knowledge. Because, again, you said you were, a, you know, ab initio straight to the F4. Maybe you, you weren't really aware of what, you know, sort of the GE 79, I think it was, that the yeah. 79, I don't know. Yeah, 79, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the American F4s had. Um, we we decided to, the Brits decided to re-engine their F4s. What was the impact of that on the aeroplane? Did you notice any any sort of, deficiencies in performance how did it work for the air defense variant that you were flying any thoughts so if you remember um, we had a, a squadron of f4 j's uh, we bought a squadron of f4 j's and 74 squadron ran them out of wattisham because we were short of was it after the falklands we um we needed to deploy airplanes to the falklands so they bridged a gap by just buying i think they bought them out the boneyard um, over in the States, just got these things over. And they had that J79 engine. So up to that point, I'd only ever seen the uh, FG1 and the FGR2. FG1s, there were some at, uh, on Treble 1 and 43 Squadron, I think, uh, when I was on the OCU. I've only ever flown the FGR2. And um, there was that thing that, you know, we put these fatter Rolls-Royce engines in, and it looked as though it let itself go a bit at the uh, at the back, but that was all kind of in keeping with uh, with how it looked. And I think it looks I think it looks spectacular with those big old fat engines in them. And I think the uh, the F four Js that we got, and maybe every other Phantom that you see, I think you know it, it's it's kind of like, they're, they're kind of like sleek and um, it it's the aerial look, with... look, isn't it? Yeah, it it just doesn't it just doesn't fit with the 
overall feel and the look of the aeroplane is supposed to look a bit wonky and uh, and whatnot. Uh, performance wise, um, it wasn't until we came up against the guys on 74 Squadron, uh, those J79 engines, I think they had better performance at, uh, at higher level. Um, they could light the burner straight away, whereas at high, high level, we, we needed to be very careful. I think we only lit one burner at a time. Uh, just in case uh, sort of thing, whereas I, I'm not sure you'd, you'd have to ask a, an F4J guy, but I think they, they had pretty much more carefree handling and it had more power up at that um, up at those higher levels. I think we had a bit more low down grunt um, down at uh, maybe low level and, and medium level. But of course, we were a bit draggier as uh, as well because the, the aeroplane's a little bit fatter. What did it mean to me? It, it meant absolutely nothing. Uh, to me because i only ever flew that um that fgr2 and you you fly you you got to play the cards that are dealt uh, aren't you and um and if i have to be a bit careful lighting the burner uh, when i'm doing high level intercepts then that's what that's what uh, that's what i have to do T- tell us about germany then tug what was your mission so you've explained that you know the 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 ultimate objective was to get to Germany if you were going to be a fast jet yeah. pilot in the RF, and I know that's true for the Buccaneer guys and the yeah. Tornado guys. It's it's universal. So, but what were you what were you guys in the Phantom tasked to do, and and can you talk us through? Because I wasn't actually aware of this um, operational badge um, thing. Yeah. Let's say I didn't know that existed. That was news to me. Can you talk us through that and and the implications of becoming an operational Phantom pilot versus yeah. Not? Uh, so remind me to come back to that because um, there's a lot to talk about with with what we did over there. So Germany, um, you, you've got the hard border with East Germany. There's in a buffer zone, um, and then there's uh, the air defence interception zone. I might have got those the wrong way round. Um, but basically, if the Russians are coming across, they're coming straight into Germany, and so Germany was peppered with uh, SAM sites. So I think. <clears throat> When I first moved over there, or in the earlier days, it was uh, Nike Hawk, I think. There was a low-level SAM and a, and a high-level SAM. And then they were they were sort of supplemented and then subsequently replaced, I think, by Patriot. And uh, I think everybody knows uh, knows about Patriot. So you had Patriot meses, missile engagement zones, all over the place, all over Germany. But, of course, they didn't have full, uh, full coverage. So we were there to plug the gaps at low level or medium level or wherever the raid is coming in, but we primarily expected it was going to be a low level uh, uh, raid um, in between those uh, those SAM meses. So we, uh, they were called Fighter Areas of Responsibility, FAORs, and we practiced um, FAOR ops every day. That was, uh, that was our primary mission, was to launch, transit out there at low level. In wartime, there were there would be these set low-level transit routes, um, uh, all very secret uh, um, uh, transit corridors and such like that. And so returning bombers, so our returning GR1s and JAGs, had to come back through the proper um, secret routing. Otherwise, it, it, it added a, a tick to their hostile list. And as you've seen a number of times, uh, Patriot, you only need to look at a Patriot the wrong way, and and the the, the thing on automatic is going to go and uh, go and shoot you down. So IFF was important, having the right IFF codes, and they changed over, you know, at set times, and so it was all quite complicated, uh, all laid out in uh, a couple of documents called Subplan Mike and Subplan Delta, um, and you. So when I say learn exam dump, the two documents I didn't dump were Subplan Mike and Subplan Delta because they were basically our SOPs. Mm. And when we launched, we never knew what we were going to see on the radar. Uh, And so we we always uh, used to say, you know, why plan when you can react? That's a classic fighter pilot thing. You know, the mud movers plan for for hours. We just turn up and shoot shit down. You know, that's uh, that's what we do. Actually, we can only do that because we, we have our SOPs nailed on in here and it was it was absolutely um almost punched into me that if you didn't know these two documents you were going to get chopped because that would translate poor performance in the air these are your life so i i did 
I did knuckle down when I uh, when I needed to. So within there, there were all sorts of uh, tactics for FAOR ops. We'd have kill zones. We'd have all sorts of different uh, little strategies uh, in there, depending on what we saw on the uh, on the radar. A big part of that was mixed fighter force. Now, um, in the Phantom, we had a, a Doppler radar, so we could uh, shoot down as well as look down. F-16s uh, out there, they only had a pulse radar, and the German F-4Fs only had a pulse radar. So we were king of the hill uh, for, um, for leading on combat air patrol, unless some random F-15s pitched up from Susterberg, which they rarely did. They always played on their own. So we were king of the hill. So that meant as a young pilot uh, working up and operational, I had to be able to lead, God, maybe up to 16 aeroplanes on cap if we were properly going to plug a, uh, a gap or do a kill zone or something. Um, so that was our job. And that's why it was so full on and, uh, and intense. Um, this whole thing about the, um, I'll come to the badge thing, uh, now, if that answers the, the question of the job, I've got, there. I've got some follow-ups, but, but yeah, yeah, and that. of course, and of course, we had uh, two airplanes on alert every uh, twenty-four hours a day, every day, um, called battle flight, and they we they were the first intercept airplanes. As soon as battle flight was launched, if it was in times of uh, tension, both of the squadrons are brought to uh, are brought to that readiness, and uh, because you know that. It, it's about to kick off. So when you go through training, um, I've always said as as pilots, we uh, aviators as a whole, we love our badges. You know, badges are a sense of belonging, and there's nothing more important than wearing the colours of your squadron. You look at that F four behind you, uh, red and yellow are, are the uh, are the colours. We had a blue aeroplane because of uh, our history of being the blue diamonds when we flew hunters. Um, but uh, red and yellow, I'm looking at that tail now, those red and yellow checks. I've got so much red and yellow stuff in this house still, years and years after serving on that squadron, because the colours are important. When you get your name badge uh, in the squadron colours, it's really important. Now, the first badge we all want to get are our wings, for starters, and you just get plain wings when you first uh, first get them. And then you get to a squadron and you you have your wings on a squadron name badge, and it's got... 92 squadron written on the top and it's in red and yellow but the badge it's always the next thing with us for air crew yeah i've got my wings what's next next is flying the airplane you want to fly okay i've passed the ocu what's next what's next is the badge that goes here which is your operational patch and you, you've probably seen them they're they're shaped a little bit like that and they've got the squadron badge in the in the middle and the motto and the, and the uh, queen's crown on the top they're, they're going to be king's crowns when um uh when you know we we have a, a change of monarch um and that's the badge that you want because that means you are no longer under training you've been under training for all this time that means that you are operational and now i am giving back to society for all that money it spent on me to get me to this point here once once they slap that badge on your um arm there you are not going to get chopped you're operational uh, now so it's it's almost it's a huge rite of passage uh, uh, for us um and that of obviously uh, we celebrate that again through the medium of alcohol and in order to get your op badge you go through this huge workup uh, which is quite intense and lots of check rides and lots of tests you prove your worth and then the boss before he gives you that op badge you have to drink the op pot and every squadron has its own op pot and it's a it's a tankard which they put in germany they put ice cold dortmund beer in it our i think ours was a bloody four pint pot it was horrific <laughs> uh and a raw egg in the bottom uh, always and uh and you basically you you down this op pot in front of the whole squadron everybody's there in the crew room there's a barrel of beer put on in the crew room. It always takes place on a Friday just before happy hour. And you, and you drink this thing. And ours, I mean, God, it took me seven minutes to drink this uh, this hot pot. And people get a bit bored with it, you know. That, that uh, But it was, it was enormous, absolutely enormous. And then you finish that hot pot. You turn it upside down on your head. The egg kind of falls on your head. And then the boss shakes your hand. And it's already Velcroed up. And he slaps it on your arm. And it's the proudest moment of your life um after getting your wings 
and it, and it's and it means something then and then you're absolutely buzzed because the uh, the alcohol kicks in and and you go to happy hour and your squadron shows you off to the other squadron hey you know we've got a new op pilot and it, and he's better than all of you lot you know and it, and it's like that and it and it's the the whole camaraderie thing um uh, based around wearing the colors is uh, is spectacular uh, and i've, I've uh, never recaptured it uh, outside of the military as, as you would but um we always hanker back to uh, to that that's why that badge is so important did you have that badge framed or uh... no i've got uh, do you know what happened um when the phantom eventually went out of service 92 squadron was the first one to go and we were gutted and one night we were all around the boss's house and uh, we all drank a toast to the squadron and somebody uh, we ripped off our op badges because we weren't operational anymore the squadron we were just going to be delivering jets and have a parade i think there was a nine ship and a, and a parade um and that was it and um we all put the badges in our pockets and there was this pledge that um from now on you carried that badge everywhere with you and if you are ever in a bar and somebody challenges you to show your badge and you don't have it then you have to drink whatever you're holding down in one and we did that for years and years. Some of us still do it, you know, uh, at the Phantom Reunion that uh, that we go to, and and that's how important that uh, that is. And I know lots of people um, uh, frame them because they're, they're so important uh, uh, to us. But that first squadron, first art badge, is the most important thing in your life. Doug, can you talk a little bit about the, the the technical aspects then of being a flight lead in an F four? leading 16 other aeroplanes setting up one of these kill zones because you've already described the, you know the complexities of flying the aeroplane everybody listening will know that the phantom had no gps no moving map you had a little radar repeater display the guy in the back was running the radar yeah. no auto well i don't know if you had autopilot but i don't know how practical it was but how do you build your situational awareness then to know where you are situated in terms of over the ground um, where you're headed, how large your track's going to be, your cap trap's going to be, um, and how you're going to make sure, presumably, that at some point, at every point in time, some of those 16 aircraft have their radars pointed in the right direction, are deconflicted from each other. What, what is the process of doing that? How difficult is it? So all of that is SOP. So we, um, uh, Supplan Mike, Supplan Delta, it wasn't just us that read it at Wildenrath. Every... Um, airbase in germany had those documents and we all stuck to that uh, to that plan so every day when i launched to do an faor trip i didn't always go to the same faors but they were generally going to be the ones that we were going to man uh, should it come to wartime there's um, and the whole of germany was split up into um Oh, better get this right. It's all to do with latitude and longitude. Thirty by sixty boxes, uh, I think, or maybe yeah, something or maybe thirty by fifteen, and you blob two together, sort of thing. And they were given um, uh, letters from north to south and numbers from east to west. So uh, we would normally work in uh, if we were up uh, in the northern areas. Lima twelve, Lima thirty would be the two boxes where we would set up our fighter area of responsibility we might go down to the Ardennes region in Belgium we might go down to the um uh near where the Nervo Gring is and that would be oh god November or Mike uh, boxes or, or whatever they uh, whatever they were um and you would um you there were set routing out to that and we we used there were two different types uh two different sets of routing for peacetime. They're called Codec, Alpha and Bravo, and we'd swap them every every few months. Uh, so we would get used to transiting out with our four ship of Phantoms in battle formation, um, doing all the correct manoeuvring on the low level route to get to the various um, FAORs. And it was almost like these, these routes were tubes that we flew through these tubes and it dumped you into your FAOR. And there were various routes, north, northeast, east, southeast, south, etc. Um, so that was uh, that was how we generally got to and from. I did nearly all of the navigation in the front because the navigator's job was to be heads in the radar 
finding targets and uh, and shooting. So generally, um, uh, Germany pilots were um, expected to do all of the all of the navigation. I'm not saying navigators didn't navigate, but their primary job was that uh, was that. I think that's unusual in a twin seat uh, aeroplane. You would expect the navigator to navigate. Once we arrive on a tower FAOR, the position of the cap is always in the same place in every FAOR. It's so many miles in from the northern part or the western part or something, uh, and the cap is always the same uh, orientation and um, uh, length of leg. So everybody who turns up on cap knows what they uh, knows what the SOP is for flying around the cap. Once we get um, we find targets and we vector off, then that's all well and good. And then there are set ways of coming back to the cap, uh, SOP ways. So as I arrive, um, at, let's say Lima 12, Lima 13, there's a set frequency for that FAOR as well. And that's all in the documents. We'll call up on that frequency and either I'll make the call or my navigator will make the call. And it'll be something like uh, Lima 12, Lima 13. And each time I make a call, I come off the um uh the transmit switch because i don't know whether people are already in there fighting and i don't want to block up the frequency so i'll go lima 12 lima 13 mike lima 72 that's my call sign probably in the airplane that i've got whichever airplane i've got has got its own call sign and i've called it mike lima because mike lima means phantom from wildenrath it, it's just the random uh, letters they gave us um four ship joining from the south and that's that's all the information i need to give what i meant if i hear nothing i know nobody's in there so i'll just set up the cap if i hear um there's two alpha golfs uh on cap i know that alpha golf i probably can't remember this properly uh, uh steve but alpha golf i think might have been phantoms out of um uh, one of the one of the bases up uh, up the north uh, up the north there, uh, maybe Vitbund or or something like that, because I know that Alpha Golf is that Alpha Lima will be F-16s out of Bovashain or or something like that. Um, so what I then need to do is get eyes on where they are, and then as I arrive in my Phantom with my look down shoot down capability, I then take control and lead of the um, uh, of the cap, and then what I'll find is. I've got F-16s just joining up on me. If I've got four phantoms, I'll set two looking hot, two looking cold in opposition to each other. And if there's four F-16s, I'm going to end up with two F-16s on each pair of uh, phantoms. It was a beautiful thing um, when, it, uh, when it worked. And, and when I say when it worked, it worked nearly all the time because everybody knew their SOPs. If I turned up in Lima 12, Lima 13 as the leader and completely porked it and said all the wrong things on the radio, all I'm doing is I'm showing up everybody in my formation to the world's air forces. Because if there's a load of F-16s in there, they're going to go, who's this joker? You know, and they ain't going to want to fly on my wing. So the pressure's on there to know your SOPs inside out, know the comm inside out as well, and apply it uh, properly at the, at the right times. And that's how we did it. It was a steep learning curve, but we did it every day. And therefore, you could go to any FAOR and the procedures were exactly the same. Um, the calls were the same, just with the different um, different letters and numbers for the FAOR uh, that you were going to. Tried and tested. And then on exercise, we do the whole thing silent. So we do a, a couple of trips where we just did silent ops, expecting that the Russians might um, jam our communication. You turn up on cap from a safe direction, set up the cap, people join on you uh, to tell people you've got contact, you'd waggle your wings and then you'd commit uh, down to low level or up to where the um, uh, target was. And everybody just knew what you were doing because they all had learned the SOPs inside out as well. It raises the question, in my mind at least, whether the Russians were watching all this because we were certainly watching what they were doing uh, East Germans and um, Soviet forces, but were they watching you? How did you? Uh, I mean, presumably you're sort of if if they know where the the FAOR stations are, they could kind of reverse engineer what what the coverage is 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 for the Patriots or for the Sam systems. Um, and if it went hot and there was actually a, a war, they would kind of know where you'd be. Well, how did you? 
So bear in mind where we are practicing our FAOR capping is quite a long way behind uh, the buffer zone and the and the inner German border. Um, so we're not actually um, practicing all the time in the actual FAORs. And to tell you the truth, I probably didn't even know where the actual FAORs were. We'd be given a block or generally, I would say at the start of uh, the conflict, if it did go hot like that, we would expect the absolute hordes coming across. Mm. We wouldn't have had time to launch any uh, GRs or JAGs across the border to uh, uh, to uh, on offensive missions. So everybody coming west is hostile. The way we would deal with that is we would set up a kill zone. Kill zone has a, a very set, um, um, it's all SOP, the dimensions of it. They would probably plug the gap between uh, uh, SAM sites with kill zones rather than FAOR. Um, Okay. Uh, as a uh, on that first couple of days where all we're going to do is we're going to anything that's got a hot vector is going to have uh, a, a rocket coming down down range at it because we know everything coming from the from the east is is hostile once if we manage to stem that tide then what we're going to do as some sites get taken out then on the uh, operational order that would come out every uh, every evening for the next day that's where FAOR um, uh, areas would be allocated. Uh, and we'd, we'd probably just get, say, um, uh, a cap position. And then in our minds, we'd build the FAOR around that cap position based on our SOPs of uh, threat direction and, and such like that. It was a long time ago now, but that's, I, I seem to remember that's, that's pretty much what it would have been. And that tallies the idea of this comms jamming. I, I um, talked to an F-15 pilot who was at Bitburg and he said that was the expectation um, among his community was that they would be jammed from the moment they took off. So they would have to do everything comm out, even, even yeah. sort of intra-flight communications would have to be done comm out. Everybody would have to know the plan. What What was your expectation then? in terms of those hordes coming at you. Uh, did you, I mean, I asked the nuke guys, you know, the guys who flew nuclear alert, the guys who flew 111s and were going to go and drop something a long way away. And they always say things like, well, you know, one F-111 guy told me, he said we'd have 60 seconds of fuel once we dropped the, the, the weapon. We'd have 60 seconds of fuel. Um, you're on your own. If you could get back, great. Yeah. And if you couldn't, tough shit. Um, and that was the philosophy. What did you think was going to happen from an air defense point of view? You've got all these airplanes co- coming at you. Did you think you were going to survive? Did you ever think about it? What were you? What were the odds that you were going to have a successful engagement, come back and land somewhere? Yeah, uh, I'll come back to that. There's something just jumped in the bed there. Um, talking to an F-15 pilot who was expecting to go com out, that would have killed them. Uh, because uh, every time they pull the trigger, they have to tell you their bloody life story about uh, what not. Uh, they were the biggest comms jammers in the history of aviation of the F-15 units. Uh, anyway, uh, back to uh, uh, back to the question. Do you know what? Somebody once put that to me, um, a, a civilian, uh, while I was um, uh, while I was over there, and we we were having drinks or something, and um, and it was. Uh, it, I mean, they were quite direct about the uh, the whole thing of. Yeah, if the Russia come across the border, that's it. We're all screwed, aren't we? And and that was I found that a real affront uh, to uh, to us because actually you're not going to be screwed uh, because I'll be there shooting these uh, these people down. You know, not not once did I think we've probably got two days worth of um, or X days worth of weapons, whatever it it will be. I was just in the mindset that. Okay, I'm going to get launched. I'll get scrambled. That's my job is to go and shoot people down. Okay, once I've shot them down, uh, I don't have to get back to Wildenrath. All I have to do is land at a uh, an airfield that's not been bombed out. Uh, they will refuel me. They've got a whole stack of Skyflash and uh, and Sidewinders because they're all over Germany. You know, in the in the dumps and whatnot. Because the SOP was you land wherever you can, refuel, and you go back again. And it was like it was. I mean, I, I say this uh, uh, glibly, it was Battle of Britain uh, mm. type stuff. You know, those uh, those guys went off, shot down as much as they could, stayed on station as long as they could, and then went back to the nearest airfield. Right, fuel it up again. Where, where are you from? Nobody said, aren't you from Tangmere? And this is Hornchurch. They, they just refueled them, rearmed them, and, and off they went. And that was the that was going to be the, the SOP. 
So I could have landed at Guttersloe, I could have landed at uh, Wittmundhaven, uh, God forbid, I could have landed at Bitburg and Susterberg and, and, and such, and, you know, out to uh, uh, watch all of those guys as well. But th that was the idea. And I didn't once think we've got five days of doing this and then we're out of weapons or we'll all be, um, uh, you know, choking on our own vomit because of uh, nerve agent poisoning and stuff like that. Didn't think of that once. Perhaps I should have done. Perhaps I just wasn't rounded enough. But perhaps I was carried away on the fact that I was uh, a fighter pilot and such like that. But all it did was it meant I didn't worry about that uh, whatsoever. Perhaps I was being naive. But I, I guess those that did worry about it were uh, much higher ranked than me and paid a lot more uh, paid a lot more money. I was just I felt I was I was at the sharp end and you know my job's to pull the trigger. And I'll keep doing it until there's nothing left uh, for me to pull. Then I'll go somewhere and perhaps they'll give me a load more rockets and, and I can go and do it again. What did you know, Tug, about the opponents that you would be facing then? This would have been uh, late 80s and Su-27 was out, MiG-29 was out. Uh, what did the RAF intelligence people know about those aeroplanes and how well versed were you on their capabilities, you know, R-27, AA-10, that type of thing. Did you know, could they outrange you? Um, were you going to have to get into the merge to kill them? Um, you know, what, 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 was, what was the general understanding of who you were going up against? So when, I was first, uh, when I first got to the Phantom and, and first to the front line as well, um, we were still looking at, um, we were there to shoot down fences, you know, uh, so big um, twin-seat bomber, um, uh, what was the uh, Flogger Delta? You know, um, a single seat, uh, single seat bomber. You know, Jaguar type uh, uh, type thing. Uh, probably going to be escorted by uh, MiG twenty one Fishbed. So that was our fighter that we were going against, a MiG twenty three Flogger, which was almost like a Phantom with swing wings. So that that was the threat. Um, I suppose they call that Generation three uh, these days, uh, Gen three threat. And that was what we kind of went up against. And all of a sudden, oh my God, the Paris Air Show and up turns a MiG-29 and a, and a Su-27. And it was like, wow, you know, we need, uh, well, oh, it's all right. We'll, we'll, let the, uh, we'll let the F-15 guys from Bitburg have them then, you know, see, then now they can show how good they are. Or the uh, F-18 uh, Canadian guys, uh, um, I think they were at uh, Susterberg, yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's let them have it. But we were we were kind of worried about these uh, these things because they were they were off the charts um, uh, different from any other Soviet uh, thing. They always say you know Soviet aeroplanes are built in a shipyard and and uh, technologically pretty uh, pretty poor, and therefore we do have the advantage with our weapon system. Think of the aeroplane as a weapon system, not just an airframe. Um, and and you you then project your power through the weapon system. Uh, there's plenty of aeroplanes out there that could outturn the Phantom, uh, but um, but that's not really what it's all about. It's uh, it's about getting shots pre-merge, getting into the merge uh, unseen, using a bit of um, uh, you know a bit of nails, a bit of tactical uh, tactical uh, sort of cleverness and cheating and 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 stuff like that. Um, and, and working together as a group rather than as an individual. So there's all sorts of things involved in that. And then, my God, we saw this MiG-29 at the Paris Air Show, and it was holy moly. Uh, God, if they get these working together, we're, we're yeah, all of a sudden we're we're the poor guys on the uh, on the block even more so. Typhoon can't come quick enough. They didn't even call it Typhoon then. It was Eurofighter. Um, and then. Um, Two weapons instructors from the OCU were at the Paris Air Show, wandered over apparently to uh, to the Russian guys and said, "Can we have a look in your cockpit?" And they, "Oh yeah, yeah." Looked in, took a load of photographs uh, in the cockpit, and uh, this is how you know intel was done in those days, I, I suppose. And then they came and gave us a briefing on what they'd see. The cockpits looked like a, an ergonomic disaster they really did and subsequently i found out um you know when the west germans got the mig-29 oh god it was an absolute pig to operate because everything in the cockpit was set up as per uh, russian tactics which was the pilots were um on the end of a string from the ground controllers um and everything that we'd heard of you know there was no 
um, so lateral thought for the, for those uh, for those pilots. I probably do them a disservice. I really do. But that was the int that we were that we were given. So actually, all right, we need to up our game a bit for this uh, MiG twenty nine thing, and um, let's see how we go. Okay, we're worried about it, but hey, you know. We were about flying against F-15s, but we still managed to beat them from time to time uh, when we do dissimilar air combat. So we took the same same kind of mindset, I think, uh, uh, to that. And then um, Germany uh, reunified. The West Germans got hold of the MiG-29, and we were we did the first trials against it down at low level, and they launched two uh, on a cap, and we were running through their uh, their cap, and um, th- this. I mean, it was typical Germany day, horrible visibility. I mean, really grim. And, um, and of course we had, um, there's a great quote from one of the, uh, uh, one of the older phantom guys at Wildenrath. Um, he said, you know, to fly around in Germany, you need eyes like a shit house rat is, is what he called it. <laughs> and our, our eyesight was, uh, was spectacular. It really was. And we could look at stuff in the gloom. Anyway, we, we went up against these two MiG 29s fully expecting to give it to get shot down. This bloody MiG-29 just pulls in front of me like that. This huge slab of metal just pulls in front of me like that. I went jelly man for about half a second trying to select the gun, uh, selected the gun and, and closed in because you're not going to put a missile in a MiG-29. If you get the opportunity, you're going to gun it. It's a very personal thing. And uh, and called, you know, Mike Lima 69 guns on the MiG-29. I was like a big hero for uh, first guy in the Royal Air Force to gun a MiG-29, you know. Um, but it, it was the first time I'd seen it up close. It looked as dirty and ugly as uh, as our aeroplane. And I think that gave me, uh, put the, the shits up me more than anything else. If it looked beautiful and slick like an F-15, well, you know, they put some work into the uh, into the looks of it. They put absolutely no work into the looks of the MiG twenty nine. It looks horrible, which means they put all the effort into uh, into its performance and its uh, and its weapon system. So that that kind of um, I thought that was more scary than uh, than anything else I'd uh, I'd heard about it. But years later, I ended up um, photo chasing the MiG twenty nine when it did some uh, um, uh, missile trials at Valley. Uh, and I was based at Valley at the time, and I photo chased it in a Hawk and um, taxied down to watch this thing start up. It had a hole in the middle of the fuel tank where the exhaust for the starter came through. And I, I was just gobsmacked at this thing. As it started up, a load of sparks came down through the fuel tank. There was a little fire underneath. They had the extinguisher there. <laughs> uh, as it got airborne, um, we had to toggle down and go 100% oxygen because it was so smoky and horrible and fuming. And we were next to it on the runway as it got airborne. And I, I, re- I refused to fly uh, behind it because I thought big lumps of coal were going to come out or, a, you know, the odd horseshoe or something, uh, because that's how it was. Uh, that's how it was uh, was built. Bottom line is you gun that thing. It's going to take a lot of bullets to uh, t- to bring it down. You know, it, it looked like a tank, uh, really. So, yeah, scary. Uh, when we first saw them, not quite so scary, scary when we saw how difficult it was for them to fly, but still, uh, I mean, a, a 15 leaps ahead from what the Soviets had had prior to that. Su-27 looked a lot more scary. Uh, that looked like it was um, uh, they'd really put some technology into into that. That the flying control system must have been off the charts good with um, the sort of things that they were doing with it. They were doing stuff with that that only the F-18 really had, had come close to uh, to doing before. And I think that worried a lot of people. You went on to fly the Hornet, and hopefully we're, you're going to mm. agree to come back and, and talk about that. But Love to, yeah. C- can I ask a couple of follow-up questions then around the, the, the kill zone uh, type yeah. scenario? How, with your very basic radar in the Phantom, how, did you, how were you going to know what was a flogger, what was a fencer? And what was a, a, a fish bed or a fulcrum or a, or a flanker? Yeah, uh, you don't. Uh, that's the thing. Um, you only know when you get uh, when you get visual. The kill zone thing was set up such that anything that came into that kill zone, on whichever way it was orientated, with a hot vector, was hostile. If you then intercepted somebody and went away from your cap point into the kill zone, and then shot somebody down. You had, you had to exit on a 90-degree vector, get outside the kill zone, and come back to the start point. Mm. You probably only get one or two iterations of that. If you turned right round, 
in the kill zone and went back to cap, you'd get shot down. Yeah. So that was the uh, that was it. So it didn't really matter whether it was a fencer, a flogger, or a um, uh, or a uh, fish bed or some. I guess uh, I guess the navs, if they had the pulse set up, oh god, I'm really going to show myself up here. I imagine a fencer's got a slightly bigger blob than a um, uh, than a fish bed, uh, so maybe the navs were. Um, would be able to uh, help you out with that. But the bottom line is, if they're coming on a hostile um, inter- in, uh, vector, uh, then uh, we don't really care. Just shoot uh, shoot down whatever comes in. I think the other thing, you mentioned it a few minutes ago in, in terms of stocks, but Skyflash, uh, that, which was the British version of uh, the AIM-7, I don't know which version of yeah. the AIM-7 it was. What was that missile all about, and was it any good... Uh, I mean, it's been long retired. I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about it, but what? How far out could yeah. you shoot something with it? What was it good at? So, um, yeah, ranges. I probably still can't um, go into that that uh, kind of detail. Uh, but of course, at low level, it's going to have less range than it will at medium level than it will at uh, at high level. Um, so, Skyflash, very similar to uh, to Sparrow. All of the Sparrows we had in the Air Force were quite old ones um can't remember what mark uh, we probably had bravos i reckon i think the sparrow went all the way up to e i i, I, I am absolutely bullshitting uh, at this point <laughs> so uh, better to get a weapons instructor on to bore the living daylights out of you about uh, uh size of uh, size of warhead and uh, circumference of the uh, of the tube yeah uh, if you're going to cut anything out cut that last uh, 20 seconds out because i was absolutely bullshitting uh, anyway the uh, the sparrows were old i did know that so when we got skyflash we didn't get any later sparrows i think i think that was the deal skyflash was uh, better than sparrow in terms of a uh, little bit of range increase on that bit of maneuverability um better the radar would discern target a, a little bit uh, a little bit better you know the radar in the front of the sky flash probably better than the one in the in the sparrow just because of age and stuff uh, stuff like that uh i think the sparrow had a better snap up so um you know if you've got a really really high level target uh we might not be able to match its uh, match its height uh, but the sparrow, uh, the sky flash, and the sparrow to a certain extent can take out a lot of that height with uh, it's called snap up. So you tell it that the target is I don't know fifteen twenty thousand feet above us or or whatever the the figure was, and um, the, there's a, a little message goes into it. And so as soon as it comes off the rail and has cleared the air, air uh, aircraft, its uh, its wings are going to do that and it's going to snap up. And um, it doesn't need to see the target straight away while it's doing that manoeuvre because uh, because it's a um, semi-active missile. We have to paint the target for it all the way through to uh, to impact. Unlike Amram, you know, the air shark, which will uh, find its own way there after uh, after a certain amount of time. So um, so it didn't matter that this thing was snapping up and maybe going unsighted on the target because we were painting the target and it would ride the continuous wave all the way to the, uh, to the target from there. So um, I think it was pretty, uh, pretty capable compared to the sparrows that we had. Um, probably just when I, I was lucky enough to go on exchange, I, I, I was flying uh, with sparrows there. Those sparrows had longer range than those sky flash because they were the, latest mark of uh, of sparrow so uh, everything just moves and 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 evolves from uh, from there but general feeling was if you had sparrows on your aeroplane rather than sky flash you weren't quite as good as you were uh, as you were with those sky flash on thanks for tuning in to 10 percent true i hope you enjoyed this episode feel free to subscribe and if you're on youtube hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode thanks and take care